If it's okay with you, Gary, I'd love to pray, pray for you. But yeah, I, I figured you might say that. He is so strong in God's grace, he doesn't even need prayer. The other thing I love is the fact that now when I look at my kids and say, get a grip, I have a completely different meaning to that, right? So when you look at each other and you say, man, just get a grip, you know we're really just encouraging each other in the grace of the Lord, right? Okay. So Father, we are grateful. We're grateful that you're intimate with us, that you are good to us, that you are a good communicator. And I, we pray blessing on this man and uh, a sensitivity to your spirit as he continues to bring that word to us and help us to receive it. Help us to be emboldened in our faith and our hope and our anticipation of how you have equipped us for the age in which we live. And we're grateful for that. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm going to let you keep going. You did pretty good. <laughs> Well, let me just say, I have these two final sessions with you, and I will fulfill my part of this conference. But uh, let me say, first of all, thank you. You've been an incredible group of people to speak to because you seem actually interested. And uh, <laughs> that's such a rare thing these days. <laughs> I did a pastor's conference for pastors in Conakry, Guinea, a couple years ago. And uh, I came back, and I was blown away because I said, man, those individuals they couldn't get enough. And they were so focused as opposed to sometimes when I preach at my own church, you know, I'm not sure anybody's actually listening. Uh, so thank you, Leland, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I always love being uh, with the YWAM family and in the interests of practicing what you preach, I wanna to introduce to you my friend Chris Young, uh, right down here in the front. And uh, Chris is from Chicago, he's a Dallas Seminary student. Uh, he'll graduate next year. And uh, I am his Paul, and he is my Timothy, but I believe in reverse mentoring uh, because I learn as much from him as he learns from me. Uh, sometimes he'll say, I just want to pick your brain. And I say, well, that won't take very long, but uh, it's, I'm glad Chris is here this morning to just be with us and to encourage him uh, in his ministry as well. Let's put the first slide up, and let's remember where we are. Uh, first of all, we talked about getting a grip, uh, getting a grip on grace. Uh, that's the G. We're going to spell out the word grace. Uh, get a grip on grace. Get it, meaning understand it, but get it, meaning receive it, the way Peter received from Jesus there in the upper room. R, reproduce your life in others. That's our theme verse, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. These things you've learned, entrust them to others, uh, faithful individuals. A, avoid excessive entanglements. Uh, Paul, he starts with the uh, means of ministry, which is grace, verse 1, the, then the mandate of ministry, which is verse 2, and then he moves on to basically the images or the metaphors uh, that he wants Timothy to keep in mind uh, as, as, uh, as he ministers. And then now in this session, uh, we talked about the soldier yesterday. Now we come to the athlete and the farmer. And in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 2, uh, the Apostle Paul says something very simple about the athlete. Um, he says, no athlete is crowned unless he or she competes according to the rules. The athlete is not crowned. You do not win a race unless you compete according to the rules. We need to unpack that. It's just a simple verse, but there's a lot of implications there particularly when we hear the word rules. So uh, we're going to talk about that, but I want to begin by talking about uh, maybe the most famous Olympics of all time. Uh, I think the, the 1972 Munich Olympics may be remembered more than any other Olympics, and for all the wrong reasons. You know, this Olympics in Munich, everybody was looking forward to it. Leland Paris was there uh, at, at that Olympics. Fran, were you there too? I think they were there at, at, at the Munich Olympics because YWAM is famous for going around wherever the action is. And there in the 72 Olympics, uh, that's the, it was called Die Heiterenspiele. It was the Happy Games. And the Die Heiterenspiele, the Happy Games, turned into the Munich Massacre. Uh, as a number of uh, uh, Israeli athletes were killed by Palestinian terrorists during the Olympic Games. 
So it, that's what it's known for, but what is uh, not usually discussed is something that I can remember <clears throat> because I was a young man at that time watching the Olympics. It used to be on the ABC Wild, uh, Wide World of Sports. Uh, you know, it was the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And the ABC was covering the Olympics, and I was watching the marathon event. And I always, I, I'm always amazed at the marathon. I'm amazed at how fast they can do. I mean, most of, I mean, we couldn't do one mile uh, as fast as they do 26 of them. Uh, so they start in the stadium and so that the crowd can get their money's worth, so the crowd can see all the runners. And then they leave the stadium and they go out and run, you know, 20 some miles out there until they come back to the stadium to finish the 26 mile race so that the crowd can cheer on the winner. In this particular Olympics, uh, the runner, the U.S. runner, was a man named Frank Shorter. And Frank Shorter was an amazing uh, marathon runner, and he was leading the pack by a long ways. And he was heading back to the stadium, and ABC, I remember uh, uh, one of the commentators was a runner I think his name was Eric Siegel. He wrote the, the book, the, uh, it was a famous movie, Love Story, I think it was called. And he was a runner, he was a commentating on it, and he said, he's blowing away the field, he's coming back to the stadium. And Frank Shorter is just breezing to the gold medal, but what Frank Shorter doesn't know is what awaits him in the tunnel as he comes back in the stadium. This didn't get much coverage. There was a man in the tunnel as you go back through the tunnel into the stadium and he had on a trench coat and he was just waiting. And he, when he saw Shorter approach the stadium, he took off his trench coat to expose not, not a rifle or a bomb, but a running suit. And he dropped the trench coat and he ran on into the stadium and started running around the track and everybody's applauding wildly because they think this is the leader of the race. And Frank Shorter, I'll never forget it, he comes in the stadium and he sees a guy up ahead of him and you could just see on his face, it was like this panic. He's thinking, this, how did I miss this guy? I, he's in first place, I'm in second. And he just starts straining to catch this guy. Unfortunately, a couple of big burly German police officers uh, helped the man off the track and out of the stadium. And so Frank Shorter could come and receive his prize. I'll never forget that. Uh, because uh, what I want to say about this image here today is in ministry, there are posers and there are players. Uh, in, in ministry, you can take shortcuts. Uh, you, you can't take a shortcut and think God's going to bless your ministry. You didn't run the whole race. You just decided to be there at the finish line. doesn't work that way. And so the Apostle Paul here in 2 Timothy 2 says an athlete, that would be you or me as we run this race set before us, an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, the word rules is a very interesting word. It's, in Greek, it's nominos. And it's, it, there's a lot of debate about what Paul is referring to here when he uses the word Nominos. It can refer to the rules of a game, but more likely it refers to the rules of training. As you know, Paul likes athletic metaphors. He's very familiar with the Corinthian games. And, and, and in those days, there were rules not just for the game itself, but you had to sign up to follow the rules for training. I found this, uh, I think I got a slide on this. I found this old quote from Pausanias, uh, who was a second century uh, Greek guy. He says this, it is custom for athletes, their fathers and their brothers, as well as their trainers to swear on an oath upon slices of boar's flesh. You've done that, I'm sure. They've sworn on <laughs> slices of boar's flesh. I call that bacon. That, that in... <laughs> that in nothing will they sin against the Olympic Games. You, you, you catch that? If, if, I, if I don't train for the Games, I'm sinning against the Olympic Games. The athlete takes this further oath also that for 10 successive months, they have strictly followed the regulations for training. 
I think, and this is opinion here, so I'll label it as opinion. I think that's what Paul's referring to. He's not talking about follow the rules, you know, because what we want to go to is say, well, the Bible has all these rules. And what he's saying is you got to follow the rules. I think he's talking about how we prepare ourselves and how the training that we involve ourselves in. I'll never forget, of course, I was a baseball player, so the rules of training are a little different than some other sports. And I'll never forget when I arrived, signed my contract, revived my first stop, minor league ball, California League, Lodi, California. Oh, Lord, stuck in Lodi. And I walked into the ballpark. It was like a scene out of a movie. I had two suitcases, and the taxi cab dropped me off. And I arrived just before the game as the guys were taking batting practice, and I walked out onto the field with my two suitcases. And I, and I walked up to the manager, because he's a manager in pro ball, not a coach. And I walked up to him and said, Coach Schaefer, and the first thing, I'll never forget what he's, the first thing he looks at me, he goes, I'm not your coach. I'm your skipper. I'm Schaefer. I'm your manager. You left your coach in college. And I went, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then when I got suited up, I went in the dugout, and here were these guys. I remember, to this day, I remember how shocked I was. They're sitting in the dugout smoking cigarettes. <laughs> and I thought, Wait, I thought we were not supposed to do that. <laughs> that but those are, that's, how, that's how they trained. It was very lax. And Paul's saying here to Timothy, no, Timothy, there are rules to training. You know this about the Corinthian games. You know this about the Olympic games, that there are rules to training, and you sign an oath that you will follow these rules of training. Uh, in the first letter of Paul to Timothy, he says this in second, uh, in, uh Actually, in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, verses 13 and 14, if you have your Bible with you, uh, in verses 13 and 14, he says, follow the pattern, follow the pattern of the sound words that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So he's saying, follow this pattern. There is a pattern that has been handed down to you from others. Uh, when you see old individuals, older individuals, uh, come before you, watch closely. Notice their pattern because that's been handed down to you because they learned that pattern from someone else. So let me just lay out for you. Here are some patterns that will help you finish the course. Because remember, that's what Paul says. I've, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. So how are we going to finish the course? Well, first of all, to be effective in ministry, follow the pattern of established principles. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of those. There, there are principles that, are, that have been established for a long time, and we, and, and we ignore them uh, to our own detriment. Okay? Here's a couple pattern. Uh, Established principles that you follow. One, there is no growth without resistance. Okay? You can deny that all you want. Like you can deny gravity if you want to. You can get on top of this roof and you can say, well, I don't believe in gravity. And I'm very sincere because remember, sincerity is everything, right? Well, I'm very sincere. I don't believe in gravity, but I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to believe in gravity. You jump off that roof, three things are going to happen. You're going to fall fast. You're going to hit hard, and you're not going to like it. And I don't care what you believe about gravity. That's how it's going to work. And so there are some established principles. One of those is there is no growth without resistance, right? Have you ever seen people, some of you work out pretty regularly? What is it that creates strength in you? Uh, you never walk into a gym, you never see professional athletes, you never see guys that are ripped who are standing there, you know, pushing up a couple cans of green beans. Because it's easy. Well, what do you see them doing? Ugh, they're straining, mm, they're pushing, they're turning blue, they're popping out veins. Ugh, because there is no growth without resistance. Now listen to me, if that's true in the physical world, why would that not be true in the spiritual world? There is no growth without resistance. 
I, I once shared this principle uh, at my church, and a lady came up to after, and she challenged me on it. She said, you know, Gary, that's not exactly true. I said, well, help me. What, what, what's not true about it? She said, well, I go to a gym where I use machines where there's no resistance. I said, tell me about that. She says, well, it's, it's wonderful. She says, you don't, even ha- you don't even have to sweat. She said, I just sit on the machine, and like I do my leg machine, and the leg machine just does my legs for me. She was sincere. And you know, sometimes people say things, and you don't know what to say. It's like, okay, that might be good for range of motion, that might be good for rehab, but you're not going to get any stronger. But it was obvious by looking at her, she didn't care about that. So, what? <laughs> come on, I mean, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know. You, you, if you concluded the same thing. What is, what is true in the uh, physical realm is true in the spiritual realm. First Peter chapter 1, Peter says, in this You have been given an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You rejoice, he says, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There is no growth without resistance. Let me take that one step further. There is no growth without pain. Uh, I I love the words of Sam Chand, and he's not writing this from a biblical, I mean, I think he's informed by biblical principles, but he's writing this about our culture. And Sam Chand says this, reluctance to face pain is your greatest limitation. There is no growth without change, no change without loss, and no loss without pain. Did you catch that, the order of those things? There is no change without loss, no loss without pain. When you interpret your pain as bigger, more important, more threatening, more comprehensive than your vision, you will redefine your vision down to the threshold of your pain. Did you catch that? Boy, that's some profound thinking. That if, if, if my ultimate objective is my own pleasure, my own comfort, uh, then, then my vision will shrink to the level of how much pain I'm willing to endure. And so Paul says, Timothy, you've got to be like an athlete, man. There's, there is no growth without resistance. You've got to train. The, 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 the second thing that he says in, in, implies in this is there's no success without assistance. There's no growth without resistance, but there's no success without assistance. And by that, I mean, we're not in this thing our, uh, on our own. We need other people. We were talking, we're talking, we're talking circles. We're talking about learning in a group environment, the things you've heard in the presence of many witnesses. I'm very thankful for the mentors I have had in my life. But I want to remind you, there is one mentor that you have and I have that Jesus has provided for us. And that mentor is mentioned in John 14, 16. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another parakletos to be with you forever. Now, my version translates it helper. It's a difficult word to translate. It's translated so many different ways. Parakletos comes from the verb parakaleo. Parakaleo, if you think of parallel, it means alongside. And kaleo is to, to call. So basically, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the one we call alongside. And it's translated very interestingly in different ways in English. Sometimes it's helper. Sometimes it's comforter. Sometimes the word is exhortation. All of that is is all appropriate translations for this word parakletos. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think comforter sounds a lot softer than exhorter. You know, to me, a comforter is someone who puts their arm around your shoulder. 
An exhorter is someone that's a little more firm and it just constantly reminds me that a pat on the back is just a few vertebrae removed from a kick in the pants. But, but we really need both of those, 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 those. As a pastor, I, I, I always challenge that statement. I, I've had so many people, I've had men sit in my office and say, well, and I've asked them, why are you divorcing your wife? Well, I just think it'd be better for everybody. And I'm sorry, I, every time I challenge it, I go, listen, I, let me just correct your thinking on that. Because I disagree. I think it's better for nobody. And so what, 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 he's, what Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Really? These guys are going, we don't know what we're going to do if you're not here. What, it's, it's to our advantage. Why is it to their advantage if he goes away? He explains it. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And then he goes on to say he will be in you. Now, why is that an advantage? Well, up to this point, Jesus has been with them, physically present with them. And as wonderful as that was, Jesus was limited by a physical body in his earthly experience. If he was on the mountain with three of them, he couldn't be down in the valley with the other nine that are getting beat up by demonic spirits. He couldn't be in two places at one time in his fleshly body and his his physical presence did not prevent the disciples from arguing and complaining and disputing and even denying him. But the promise here in John 14 and 16 is that the Holy Spirit would be in them. In other words, now the fullness of God, the presence of Christ, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit is no longer limited to one place and one time. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Um. I mean, think of it this way. If you have, a, let's say you have a son who loves football. And let's say your son has a pretty good arm. Uh, let me ask you this question. Would, would, uh, would, would, would it be better for him to spend two months with Tom Brady? Yeah, I say that some people are not going to like that because some people don't like Tom Brady. Two months with Tom Brady, but what if by some miracle Tom Brady could be in them? Maybe it doesn't change your abilities, but boy, if you could think like Tom Brady, and if you could see the field like Tom Brady, and if you could make decisions like Tom, so it's much better for him to be in you than to be with you. And this is what Jesus tells them. You need the Holy Spirit on board, you need to constantly walk by the Spirit, in, invite the Spirit to, to fill you, to influence you to the, to the maximum amount. Because there's not only no growth without resistance, there's no success in ministry without assistance. And the assistance we need is from the Holy Spirit. So, um, follow established principles. Here's another principle. To be effective in ministry... Uh, not, not only do we follow the pattern of established principles, but follow the pattern of sound doctrine. <clears throat> over and over in the pastoral epistles, this is emphasized in Paul's letters to Timothy uh, and to Titus. Here, here's a couple places uh, where you find it. 1 Timothy 4.6. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you've followed. 1 Timothy 6, verse 2. Teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching uh, that accords with godliness. And that's what he has sent Timothy to do. Um, uh, se 2 Timothy 1, uh, follow the pattern. The, it's tupas, follow, it's a pattern, it's a type. You hear it talk about a prototype, it's not the actual thing, but it's a type. Uh, he's saying, follow this, this type, uh, th this, this example of sound words, he says. 
and, and don't let them to quarrel about words, which is not good, only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So f follow the pattern of, of sound doctrine. Um, by now, you understand, and we all know this, uh, we, we've been around long enough to know that, that this world is off key. This world is out of tune. And we have a prophetic role to play in this world because it is so far from, from God's standards and so far from sound thinking. Um, where else? We, we have such challenges ahead of us. I'm serious. I'm, I know I'm, in some, some days, I, some days I, I feel like the Apostle Paul. I'm, I'm so close to the finish line, I'm just ready to get across the tape. And then other times I want to stay and help as long as I can. And, you know, Paul said, I don't, I'm hard-pressed. I don't know which to do. I want to just turn my face to the wall and die, but yet I'm going to stay on for your sake, he says to the Philippians. Because never in my life would I have ever guessed we can't define simple things. We, the world around us can't even define simple things. What is a man? Oh, wait, are you using cisgender? Uh, or, I don't even know what cisgender means. I just threw that out to sound smart. I, I don't even know what that means. What is a woman? What's marriage? I mean, for 5,000 years, people kind of understood what it was. But we're so smart now, we go, well, now, wait a minute. Who knows what we'll be challenging next? I remember I, I, I talked to someone one time and I said, you know, I, I really, if you think about it logically, I believe God has assigned roles to different roles for men than women. And we could have a long, healthy discussion about that. But I said, I'll change my view on that when men start having babies. It's really hard to deny the fact that God, God assigned different roles to men than he did to women. Women are the ones who... Well, I'm sorry, they're not mothers. They are, what are they now? Um, birthing people. Uh, God assigned the, I can't even say woman. God assigned the one of the couple to be the birthing person. Um, and that person challenged me and said, well, that's not true. Now men are having babies. I don't even know how that works. So this is the kind of world that we live in and God has called us to a prophetic role to teach these principles. We have to do it with love. We have to do it with gentleness. We have to do it with reverence. But we've, for us, we have to really dig into these established principles and this sound doctrine and make sure that our doctrine is sound. Here's another one. To be effective in ministry, provide a pattern of sound living. So we're providing a pattern. Paul is saying, Timothy, I want you to provide a pattern of established principles to your audience. I want you to provide a pattern of sound doctrine, but I want you to provide a pattern of sound living, not just sound doctrine. Um, a pattern of personal behavior. Listen, never forget this. Ministry is a character profession. It's a character profession. If, if you say, I'm a follower of Jesus and I've been called to ministry, then people will expect something different of you than they expect from many other people. I, I love the words of Chuck Swindoll when he says, ministry is a character profession. To put it bluntly, you can sleep around and still be a good brain surgeon. You can cheat on your mate and have little trouble practicing law. Apparently, it's no problem to stay in politics and plagiarize. You can be a successful salesperson and cheat on your income tax. But you cannot do these things as a Christian or as a minister of the gospel and continue enjoying the Lord's blessing. Ministry is a character profession. And now, more than ever, we have a culture that's calling us on our inconsistencies. It's killing us. Who said this? You Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces and turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet, but you treat it as though it's nothing more than a piece of literature. 
You know who said that? Mahatma Gandhi. He called Christians on the way in which we treat the scriptures and how lightly the scriptures rest upon us. So let me close this part about athletes by emphasizing that I believe that ministry is a relay race. You know, we've looked at a couple images now. We talked about the cathedral project. Let me throw another image before you in, in, that describes ministry. It's a really relay race. And I would say to you, never run alone. I think that's another principle that Paul teaches Timothy. There's, <laughs> when I first started working at, at Mercy Ships, about I've been on boards and been involved since 92, but I started working there seven months ago. And when I got there, they were very attracted to this proverb. It's an African proverb. Maybe you've heard it. The African proverb says, if you want to go fast, run alone. But if you want to go far, run together. Isn't that a nice proverb? It's just not true. <laughs> it sounds really good. But I started thinking about it and realized that's just not true. If you want to go fast, run alone. Okay, let me share with you what went through my head because I've watched races and one, the fastest person in the world running the 400 meters runs it in 43.03 seconds. 400 meters in 43 seconds. Wow. If you want to go fast, go alone. Well, let me tell you what the time is for four by 100. 400 meters run by four people. Are you ready for this? The world record for the one individual running the 400 meters is 43 seconds. The world record for a four by 100 relay team running the same distance is 36.84 seconds. That's 6.19 seconds faster if you run with a team than if you run by yourself. Now listen, and you know if you're a runner, you, you know that over 400 meters, six seconds is like an eternity. And you can run it faster if you run together, but there's a catch, isn't there? The only thing that can keep you from running it faster if you're a team is if you're careless with the baton. And you got to pass that baton because if you drop the baton, you know what? You're disqualified. The race is over for you. Don't drop the baton. This is why Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, remember your leaders. Those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Philippians 3, Paul says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the... And he uses this word that he used in 2 Timothy. He says, uh, keep your eyes on those who walk according to the tupas, according to the pattern that you have in us. What you have learned and received and heard in me, he says to the Philippians, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Let me challenge you this morning. Here's my last question for you. Could you say that? Are you willing to say that to your children? Are you willing to say that to someone? Would you, would you say to them, hey, listen, um, I want you to watch my life. And whatever you learn and whatever you receive, and whatever you hear, and whatever you see in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. You'll, you'll experience shalom. Now, how many parents say, oh, don't do, you know, I, when I was younger, so don't do what I say, don't do what I do. Um, in the race that God has set before us, Follow the pattern of established principles. Follow the pattern of sound doctrine. Follow the pattern of sound living. And don't run alone. Because sometimes you may fall short if you're trying to do it on your own. I want to show you a brief video. Some of you may have seen this. 
But I was so inspired by this video, and I think it's a great way to end this session. Now, these two brothers, the Brownleys, uh, from Great Britain, and they were running in a marathon, and I want you to see what happens at the end of the race. If you haven't seen this, take a look. Joining us to win. And to be sure of taking the title. And right now he seems to have lost control of his legs. And this is worrying. Oh, and he's starting to slow. And there is a little way to go. There's half a K to go. And Johnny is running out of time and is losing. He's losing his sense of direction. This is worrying. Oh, goodness me. This is a horrible sight. Jonathan Brownlee has lost it now and has staggered to a stop at the side of the course. And Alistair's stopped to help him along. And Alistair is going to try and carry his brother home. Dramatic scenes in Cozumel as the Olympic champion carries his younger brother towards the podium. Oh my God, I cannot believe what we are seeing here. Matt, is this allowed? Is he allowed to help his brother? You know, is that part of the rules? I'm not too sure. We've never seen anything like this before. Unbelievable scenes. Unbelievable scenes in Cozumel. The Brownlee brothers arm in arm, but it's not by way of celebration. Henry Schumann's celebrating. He's going to win this race in Cozumel out of nowhere. But we have to be concerned about the health of Jonathan Brownlee and they're not even on the final stretch yet. Schumann wins in Cozumel. The brothers are coming home arm in arm to finish in second and third but Johnny can hardly stand and Alistair is having to drag him across the line and pushing him home, pushing him home for second. Johnny finishes in second. Goodness me. What an incredible conclusion here in Cozumel. I've never seen anything like that anywhere in world sports. <laughs> Worrying scenes all round. <laughs> so much, so much in that clip. First of all, did you notice they gave up first place? In order to help his brother, first place was out of the question. But he had a higher priority. His higher priority that his brother would finish and cross the finish line. And then don't you love it when he gets to the finish line, he just takes his brother, <laughs> shoves him over. <laughs> he even gives up second place by shoving his brother across. Listen, you're going to work with people, some who are so difficult, and they're going to get tired. Some of you are tired. I mean, it's tough, man. You gotta keep running till you get to the finish line. When my son was about 10 years old, he has a twin sister, and the two of them were in a track meet. And uh, my wife and I went, and when you have twins, we, we kinda had to separate out, and it was during the day, and the good news was I was a pastor at the time, so I didn't have a real job, so I could go to these things. <laughs> So uh, my wife went with my daughter to some event, and my son was r r running in a relay race. And, you know, when they're eight, years, eight or nine years old, they're, they're not cool yet, which was clear by the fact that my son's white socks were pulled up to his knee, and I think he was wearing Vans, slip-in shoes or something, and he's in the relay race, and he's going second, and I'm really nervous. And the reason I'm nervous is because a lot of people don't know this, but my son has a congenital disease. He got it from me. It's called slow. <laughs> and, and so uh, he's the second leg of this race. And, you know, these schools, you know, these schools sometimes don't have level fields. They just pick a field. And it was kind of a downhill field, which I thought, well, that might be to his advantage. So the race starts at the other end. And the, and the guy, the people that go for it's like eight teams. And the person from our school starts out, does a great job. We're leading the race now. And the baton is passed to my son. And I'm going, oh, help him, Jesus, help him. This is what they say every time I get up to preach in my church. Help him, Jesus, help him. <laughs> 
and I'm going to help him, Jesus. And he takes off. And my son, I mean, I'm amazed. He is just, he's picking them up and putting them down until he has his first experience with this thing called adrenaline. And now he's actually, his body is, his, his mind and his motivation they're, they're, are going way faster than his body was designed to go. And, and you know when this happens because the first thing is you start seeing the windmill. <laughs> As he gets his body out over his legs and I'm going, no, 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 no. And sure enough, man, he belly flops. And, you know, it's one of those really bad fields with a lot of dirt. So he, he just belly flops and he's full of dirt. And I'm standing there. And honestly, this is the truth. I wasn't sure what to do. Now, you, you who are moms, you're going, what do you mean you weren't sure what to do? <laughs> and I was standing with a bunch of moms. And they're all looking at me. And so I'm not sure what to do, but I don't want to be standing next to them. So I start walking down the, tr the course on the outside of the track. And I start walking down toward where my son is. And by the time I get down parallel with him, uh, he's laying there. He's got big tears. I mean, he's, he feels like he's failed his team. And, and he's got dirt on his shirt. And the baton is laying there next to him. And I don't know what to say. And somehow in the moment, I just believe that God ca caused me to say this because I got down like this. And when, 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 we, when, we, when our eyes met, I said, can you finish, son? Can you finish? And that moment has inspired me to this day because he looked at me and he wiped his eyes with his dirty hands and he grabbed that baton and he got up and he ran to the end and handed the baton to the next guy. And our team finished about five minutes after the last place team finished. <laughs> you know, it didn't matter to me. It did not matter to me. I, I don't care how many blue ribbons people won that day. There was no one prouder that day at that track meet than I was because my son finished. And I honestly believe this with all of my heart. I believe part of my job in coming here and being with you is to ask you the same question because some of you want to quit. If you don't want to quit today, you will, you will next week. <laughs> it's hard. It's universal. Listen, every Sunday I would be done preaching. I, I can't tell you how many times I resigned as pastor on Sunday because I didn't think I had it. And almost without exception, every Monday morning, God would reject my resignation. <laughs> and he would say, can you finish? It doesn't mean you never change course, you never change direction, you never change location. It doesn't mean that. But I want to challenge you to think about what does it look like in your ministry to finish well? And I can tell you part of that is what we're talking about here this weekend. To finish well is to transfer the faith from one generation to the next. To find a successor and pass it on. To finish well is to call the next person to build the cathedral. To finish well is to pass the baton to the next person that's going to continue the race. Can you finish? Father, life is hard. And Lord, we get tired and as I watch that man kind of lose control of his limbs because he's been trying so hard for so long, doesn't look like he's going to be able to get to the finish line. But his brother made sure that he did. Lord, first of all, would you um, remind us that part of our job is to get people across the finish line? Some of us will walk into the kingdom. Some will need to be carried in. But, uh, Father, help us to remember that's part of our calling. And then I pray for my brothers and sisters, wherever they are right now in their journey, that you would keep them running. I pray that this weekend will be a shot in the arm. It will be a fresh breath of air. It will it'll be a shot of adrenaline, whatever they need to get back and continue the course that you've placed them on. And Lord God, we will thank you in advance for the results because I know it'll be good. We pray these things in your name.
Amen.